Dear colleagues, it is uh, two o'clock. It is time for our today keynote. And I'm very glad to be able to present Professor Michael Apple, who is in vivo with us. Uh, Michael Apple is a professor of curriculum and instruction and education policy studies at uh, the University of Wisconsin Medicine, US. He also holds uh, professorial appointments at the University of Manchester, UK, and at other universities in multiple countries. A former elementary and uh, secondary school teacher and past president of uh, a teacher's union, he has worked with education systems, governments, universities, unions, and activists and dissident groups throughout the world to democratize education research policy and practice. And this is how I met him for the first time in Ljubljana, Slovenia in Michael 1980, 90, 90, 90. <laughs> 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 has been selected as one of the 50 most important educational scholars in the 20th century. His books, Ideology and Curriculum, and Official Knowledge were also selected as two of the most significant books on education in the 20th century. His books and articles have won numerous awards and have been translated into many languages. He has been awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the American Education Research Association, the UCLA Medal for Outstanding Academic Achievement, and a number of honorary doctorates by universities throughout the world. Professor Ethel has worked on education reform, lectured and taught in a considerable number of countries throughout the world, where his material has been extremely influential in the development of more socially critical and democratic education policies and practices. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. My parents would be very pleased with that introduction. <laughs> I don't recognize the person in it, but that's fine. Uh, I'm going to do something I normally do not do, but because the arguments I'm trying to understand are complicated, I am going to stick to a text. Those of you who have heard me before know that is very unusual for me. So I will be reading. That is not the best pedagogic style. I understand that. Can people hear me in the back? Thank you. And in conclusion, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but, but because I'm trying to work off of two recent books, Educating the Right Way, which focused on what I think answers the question that I pose to this audience, which is Can Education Change Society, which is the name of the more recent book, I think it is no longer a useful question. I think we should stop asking the question, can education change society? Because it has been answered in Hungary, in Greece, in the United States, in Australia, in China, in any nation represented in this room. The right has shown that education is a crucial element in ideological transformation, in the changes in people's identities. The right understands Gramsci better than the left. This is a war position where everything counts. So I don't want to answer that question anymore. I think that it leads to cynicism among us, and in many ways to intellectual suicide. We become so fascinated with debunking our own work that we actually become less powerful, I think, than we could be. So I'm going to start out by focusing in some ways on the right and what it has done and then move quickly to the most dangerous word in the English language, which is the we. Who are the we? And for those of us who think of ourselves as public intellectuals, who we say our work must do something, not just in schools, though that is crucial, but in the relationship to schools and larger social formations, what should that we do? All right? OK, I'm done. You're all nodding. You don't need to hear the rest. 
for, you'll, for, you'll forgive the humor, my last name is Apple. I spent many years teaching in primary schools. And if you walk into a primary classroom and introduce yourself, hello children, my name is Mr. Apple. <laughs> you better have a very juvenile sense of humor, otherwise you will not see one. But do not misinterpret me. The work that we do is absolutely serious. So my teaching style may be in some ways occasionally humorous, but what I have to say now is not humorous at all. And not just at the train station in Budapest, though it would be useful if we thought about that as well. All right. So I'm going to read. Please do not interrupt you, me with your snores. Okay. I want to begin this lecture with a personal example of some recent international politics surrounding school reforms. It's an example that illuminates the damaging effects of some of the radically undemocratic policies that are being put in place by conservative governments and social movements in all too many countries. These are movements and reforms that already show that education remains part of social transformation, whether we like it or not. Two years ago, as some of you in this audience know very, very well since you participated in this, I spent a semester as a visiting professor at a university in Australia that will be nameless called Melbourne. <laughs> During my time in Melbourne, I was asked to give a lecture to school principals and teachers in which I was to critically reflect on the policies that were being proposed in education and on how we could make schools more responsive to oppressed communities there and elsewhere. After I was given the invitation, a number of members of the State Department of Education and Early Childhood Development, I love the acronym DEECD, -E deceased, <laughs> came to hear me give a more academic address at the university on the politics and effects of neoliberal agendas in education. Within a few days of that university address, a much more academic address, my invitation to speak to school leaders was canceled. I quote, my services were no longer required. What I had to say was too controversial. The context of this decision was the following. The neoliberal government of the state was intent on imposing such policies as performance pay for teachers and principals, increased support for private and religious schools, corporate models of management, anti-union policies, and similar kinds of things. The union of teachers and principals deeply opposed to these policies, but the government was adamant in having them take effect and was not willing to uh, bargain seriously over them. It also made it clear that it was not at all pleased to have these issues discussed publicly. Let us be honest. This is a very difficult time in education. Neoliberal and neoconservative policies have had major effects on schools, on communities, on administrators, on teachers, on research, on all school staff. As I point out in a number of recent books, and not only me, many people in this audience have been my teacher on exactly these kinds of things. As, as, as I point out in others, under the influence of these, those with increasing power in education, and in all too much of society, what is public is supposedly bad, and what is private is supposedly good. Budget cuts have been pushed forward, jobs have been cut, Attacks on educators at all levels and on their autonomy and their organizations gain more visibility. Corporate models of competition, accountability, and measurement have been imposed. Continual insecurity has become the norm. And the loss of respect for the professionalism of educators and researchers on it is striking. And these are truly international tendencies, ones found in an entire range of the seats in this audience and where people come from. Now what happened over the ensuing month was important, since the government created even more problems than it thought it had solved. There was an immediate sense of outrage on the part of educators, researchers, and progressive groups. The media always loving a story that showed that education was a site of inequity of whatever kind, jumped at it. There was outrage as well. They publicized the act of censorship, and published a number of interviews with me and others in this audience condemning the government's actions. 
the news stories about the decision to cancel my lecture, and more importantly, about the issues that it raised concerning the disrespect the government consistently showed to teachers and school administrators, and even more consistently to the poor and working class communities of that city, that nation, and this world, went viral on Facebook, Twitter, and other forms of social media. Actions and movements around the issues emerged and grew. In response, the Australian Education Union organized an even larger audience for what was called the Cancelled Lecture, <laughs> understanding and challenging the attacks on state education. It was held at exactly the same date and time as the original lecture had been cancelled. The union also broadcast the lecture to many schools within the state, whose distance from Melbourne made it impossible for principals and teachers to attend. In a final act of resistance, many, many principals and teachers who would have gone to the conference at which I was to originally speak left the government-sponsored conference and instead came to the union headquarters to hear me and others. We collectively engaged in a detailed discussion of the politics of education, the transformations that the right was doing, the disrespect of educating that was going on, and especially how to resist the reforms that were being imposed on schools, on universities, on organizations of NGOs, on community and youth workers, and on all other areas of social policy. Now, a number of things are clear in this example of the politics of policy at a ground level. Very often, the decisions made by powerful groups to manage consent by presenting only the knowledge which they consider to be safe can lead to contradictory results. They can and do create spaces for interruption. And in this case, the organized action of educational unions and progressive social movements played a large part in countering these decisions. It's clear now that very similar things are happening in a number of nations represented in this conference as well. Now, I've given a rather personal introduction to my talk today to remind us something that I hope no one needs reminding, that this is a time when education has become even more a site of ideological, political, and pedagogic struggle. It is a time when we must decide how we are to engage with groups involved in dealing with all of this in critically democratic ways. Dominant groups have attempted, often more than a little successfully, to limit criticism, to control access to research that documents the negative effects of their policies, and to deny the possibility of critically democratic alternatives and critically democratic research into those alternatives. They have pressed forward with an agenda that is claimed to simply guarantee efficiency effectiveness and cost savings, the mantra, the prayer of officials. For them, only these kinds of policies can deal with the crisis in education, even when, as researchers in this audience have demonstrated for years, they are simply wrong. Now, dominant groups are not totally wrong in guiding their reforms in a sense of crisis. Across the political spectrum, it is widely recognized that there is a crisis in education. Nearly everyone agrees, I would hope by now, that something must be done to make it more responsive and more effective. Let us not be romantic about existing class relations, existing relations of gender and sexuality, of the way race structures national and international forms. Our task is not simply to defend the public as it exists now. That would be a grave mistake, but we must defend the idea of a democratic space and a democratic public. That puts us in a very complicated position. Let us again be honest, however, for the educational crisis is real, especially for the poor and oppressed. Dominant groups, though, have used such crisis talk to shift the discussion onto their own terrain. Now, one of the major reasons for the continuation of dominant discourse and policies is that the very nature of our common sense about education is constantly being altered. This is largely the result of the power of particular groups. And by the way, it is not only neoliberals. We do a disservice to education in only talking about neoliberalism. 
It's largely the result of a power of particular groups. That's a broader alliance who understand that if they can change the basic way we think about our society and its institutions, including schools, and especially our place in these institutions, then they can create a set of policies that will profoundly benefit them more than anyone else. Dominant groups have actually engaged in a prairie dialogue with us. They have in many ways engaged in a vast social and pedagogic project, one in which what counts as good schools, good knowledge, good teaching, a good student, good learning, good research has been radically altered. They have used educational processes to transform our ability to even ask questions. They are changing society, not only through schools, but through the reconstruction of identities and the reconstruction of the common sense we use to understand our lives and our roles at our institutions and in the public itself. But let me say more about this process. First, a glass of Schlebowitz. Um, I fear it isn't. I was hoping. This is my Foucaultian moment. <laughs> I have the water. I hope you do not. <laughs> but as my postmodern friends remind me, I must always own my power. <laughs> I will try and offend each of you at least once. If I haven't, would you let me know? I'm fairly good at it. Now, um, all right, so let me go on. Uh, let me say more about this process. In a large number of countries, a complex alliance and power block has been formed that has increasing influence in education and all things social. This power, power block that Roger Dale originally called conservative modernization often combines four major groups, not simply neoliberals. The first and the strongest one includes multiple fractions of capital who are committed to neoliberal marketized solutions to educational problems. For them, as I mentioned, private is necessarily good and public is necessarily bad. Democracy, as Raymond Williams reminds us, there are key words with emotional economies, and democracy is one of the major words they have struggled over. And what they have done, since this is such a key word, is reduced to consumption practices. It is what we call thin democracy in philosophy, not thick. The world becomes a vast supermarket, one in which those, as we know, with economic and cultural capital are advantaged in nearly every sector of society. We did not need the brilliant work of Piketty to understand that, though he helped, to say the least, by publicizing what so many groups already understood. Choice in a market then replaces more collective and more socially responsive actions. Thin democracy replaces thick democracy. And this crucially demobilizes critical progressive social movements that have been the driving force behind nearly all of the democratic changes in our societies and our schools. Educators do not change society. Social movements do. And it is social movements that transform education. In education, this is grounded in the belief by them that the more we marketize, the more we bring corporate models into education, the more we can hold schools, administrators, and teachers feet to the fire of competition, often through that eloquent, that eloquent fiction that value-added research will show us the way, as my closest friend in the value-added movement reminds us, we are 20 years away from even being able to do that technically. Yet whole nations are engaged in that, and many of us in this room may in fact engage in research on the value of it. There is very little evidence to support it. I've now alienated a few more. That's okay. That's what I was brought here to do, honestly. But, okay. but again, supposedly, the more we can hold people to the feet of comp the, the fire of competition, the better they will be. And as I just mentioned, there actually is very little evidence to support this contention, and a good deal of evidence internationally that it often increases inequality. But neoliberalism continues to act as something like a religion, and that it seems to be impervious 
to empirical evidence, even as the crisis it has created in the economy and in communities, and not only Greece, constantly documents its failures in every moment of our collective and individual lives. But there is a second group. The second most powerful group in this alliance is the of conservatives, who want a return to higher standards and another eloquent, dangerous fiction, common culture. In the face of diasporic populations who are making the United States, England, Spain, Germany, Sweden, Norway, Hungary, Australia, every nation represented, I hope, in this room, many, many other nations, a vast and impressive experiment in continual cultural creation is going on. And in the midst of this, neoconservatives are committed to conservative, a conservative culturally restorative project pressing for a return to an imposed sense of nation and tradition that is most usually based on a fear of pollution from the culture and the body of those whom they consider the other. That there is a crucial and partly hidden, at least to some people, dynamic of race at work here is not unimportant to say the least. Now neoconservatives assume something that is not there in most nations a consensus on what should be official knowledge. They thereby try to eliminate one of the most powerful questions that should be asked about education. What and whose knowledge should we teach? And in their certainty over what a common culture is supposed to be, they ignore a key element in that supposed commonness. What is common in almost every nation is that we disagree on what is common. Indeed, what needs to be the common is the constant democratic and deliberative process of asking the question, what is common? In which all people, including diasporic people, newly emerging as the crisis, are deeply involved in that conversation. And that requires that we remove all barriers to that conversation. Deliberation is not a simple thing. It requires economic redistribution, and political transformation. To the extent we do believe in the common, the common is a verb, it is not a noun. It is to be built, it is never found. It is always in process. A third key element to conservative modernization is composed of authoritarian populist religious conservatives, many of them within already dominant groups, who are deeply worried about secularity and the preservation of their own traditions. They too wish to impose a common. For them, the people must decide. But there are anointed people and those who are not. Only when a particular reading of very conservative Christianity, or in some nations this is represented by repressive forms of Judaism, Hinduism, Islam, is put back in its rightful place as the guiding project of all of our institutions and interactions, only then we'll be able to once again claim for ourselves that we are creating God's country. In this process, many of these groups inaccurately construct themselves as the new oppressed, as people whose identities and cultures are ignored by or attacked by schools. Do not misinterpret me. I work with progressive religious activists throughout the world, with Islamic feminists, with Palestinians who believe that Islam is crucial to their work, and we need to be immensely respectful to the religious traditions that give meaning to so many millions of people. And in fact, many progressives push people who are religious into the hands of neoliberalism because of our disrespect. And that is deeply unfortunate. But at the same time, the uses of this by already dominant group, a practice that often functions to reproduce whiteness in the United States, Australia, and many places in Europe, is deeply worrisome. It is not an accident, for example, that the fastest growing educational movement in the United States is not school choice, it is not neoliberalism, it is not academies and charter schools, it is homeschooling, where three million children have been pulled even out of church schools and mosque schools, madrasas as well, to be schooled at home to keep them from the body and culture of the polluting other. So let us remember 
what is going on about this. And to the extent we talk about education that's only occurring in schools in our research, we are missing powerful transformations that are going on. In fact, the fastest statistically significant growing movement among black parents in the United States is now homeschooling. I quote, there is genocide of the body and culture going on for my child. And as the parent of a black child myself, I am more than a little sympathetic to this. There is not only symbolic violence going on, there is me. Forgive me for getting emotional about that, but if we can't get emotional about that, I wonder what we can get emotional about. All right. So, finally, a crucial part of this ideological umbrella is a particular fraction of the professional and managerial and middle class who've occupied positions within the state and at universities. This group is made up of people who are committed to the ideology and techniques of accountability, measurement, the new managerialism, to what has been called audit cultures, performativity, in Stephen Ball's words. They too are true believers, ones who believe that installing such procedures and rules, and so doing, they are helping. For them, more evidence on schools, teachers, and students' performance, usually simply based on the limited data from PISA scores and others, will solve our problems, even though, once again, there is just as much evidence, empirically and historically, that this too can create as many problems as supposedly solves, demonstrating that one is acting correctly according to externally imposed criteria is the norm, perform or die, seems to be the religious impulse behind this as well. Now this new alliance has integrated education into a wider set of ideological commitments. The objectives in education are the same which guide its economic and social welfare goals, and in fact, the transformations of the schools are directly involved in these transformations. Schools are not something outside society, they are part of society. And we do a disservice to that by saying we must wait for no school changes can occur until society changes. Even if one is an essentializing and reductive Marxist of a particular kind that says only changes in the economy can change schools, the economy is made up of sites of economic production and distribution. That is what the economy is. As I remember correctly, people work in schools. That is the economy. The people who cook food for the children are working. The crossing guards are working. The teachers are working. The principal is working. The secretary is working. That is the economy. If you are serious about saying, I can do nothing until I change the economy, it would be good if we also thought about universities as workplaces that deserve our attention as that was a little bomb I just threw. <laughs> okay. Now this new alliance includes the dramatic expansion of that eloquent fiction, the free market, which does not exist, the drastic reduction of government responsibility for social needs, the reinforcement of intensely competitive structures of mobility, both inside and outside the school, the lowering of people's expectations for economic security, the disciplining of culture and the body, and the popularization of what is clearly a form of social Darwinist thinking. I've given this brief description of this hegemonic bloc because I want to situate most of my recent work and the recent work of many people in this audience in the current conflicts, social movements, and contradictions. Now, stressing the social and political in education is not new, of course, either here or elsewhere. Many critical scholars have discussed this at great length internationally, and again, many of the teachers to, of me in trying to understand that are in this room. However, under current situations, not only is this fact easy for us to forget, but also while the act of criticism is important, it is never sufficient. <coughs> One of the reasons the right wins is they take seriously the question, what do I do on Monday? 
And we might spend a little time on that ourselves. But if that is the only question we ask, I would often run screaming from the room. It is not sufficient. Now I want to switch gears a bit. If educational work is important, if the right has shown that it is important, if it shows it all the time that it's important, what should our responsibility be? Too often we connect fear, tell other people what to do. I'm a little tired of that. I'd like to spend the remaining part saying, who's the we? And what responsibilities might we have? OK? So I'm going to give you a list of nine things. Since this is an education conference, there'll be an exam at the end. <laughs> it is high stakes. You will all lose your degrees. Of course, the right thinks they're not worth it, worth it anyway. Because we're in education, it's not science and other forms of masculine endeavors. Uh, OK. So in some ways, let me now go through nine points, knowing that these are beginnings. And if we had all day and you could be my teachers, we would come up with a hundred. This is a preliminary list. It's very taxonomic, with my getting help from activists in Seoul, in Ankara, in Beijing, in Shanghai, and from many people here in Australia. Well, maybe not, but no. <laughs> Some people in Australia, not to the government. Um, but then I'm from the United States, which is, I remember, described as the empire. Um, so uh, this is being taped. I have to be a little more. <laughs> um, OK. I mean, I was arrested in Korea for giving a speech like this. But I would prefer it wasn't pleasant, so never mind. <laughs> OK, so, so what are these nine points, things that we should be doing? And in, increasing the we at the same time. The first task is a simple one that we actually are very, very good at. That is, we must bear witness to negativity. If, even if we cannot transform these places, universities, schools, NGOs, community literacy projects, there is still a role that must be played, which is to tell the truth. Well, you'll forgive me, but the post position that is all a group of stories is epistemologically untenable. Poverty is not a story. We make discourses about it. Discourses have independent power. They're absolutely crucial to any political project, positive or negative. But it is an act of arrogance to assume that we have nothing important to say about the reality that is being constructed daily in schools and elsewhere. I want to be careful about using words like bear witness to negativity because it is part of a Western biblical tradition. And at the end of this, I would welcome people who are Muslim, Hindu, Jewish, Catholic, whatever <coughs> visible forms that understand that telling the truth is an act of trying to transform oneself and that reality, I need other words. But I choose this word because in the West, and certainly in my own nation, the idea of bearing witness becomes crucial. So one of our primary functions then is to illuminate the ways in which educational policy and practice are connected to the relations of exploitation and domination and to struggles against such relations in the larger society. And this is crucial. Because dominant groups often live in what I would like to call an epistemological fog. To know is to be called upon to act. And not knowing is much easier than knowing. Which is one of the reasons we attack research. Because to know is dangerous. Therefore, much of the research we're already doing needs to go on. Second. In engaging in such critical analysis, we must also point to contradictions to spaces of possible action. 
let me remind you that one of the reasons that neoliberals and neoconservatives are so angry about educational research, about schools and universities, is one simple fact. There must be something important going on there. If we were only doing what they wanted, why would they care? So they are cutting budgets, they are putting in place quotas for research, they are measuring us as never before. Why? So that there is no time for the luxury of critical thought. So part of our task must be to understand that in every space that they try to control, there are always possibilities that they are created, that are created, and we must document those spaces. But in, in doing this, it's absolutely crucial, because since otherwise, if we only bear witness, our research can simply lead to cynicism and despair, and cynicism and despair can only assist those who do not have our interests or the interests of oppressed groups in their eyes, if you will. Third, at times this requires broadening what counts as research and what we value. And here I mean acting as critical secretaries of those groups of people, communities, and social movements who are now engaged in challenging existing relations of unequal power from what elsewhere has been called non-reformist reforms, that is, struggles that change something that's small, but it opens the door to, door to larger reforms. Andre Gortz, one of the most powerful German scholars. This is a task that was taken up by uh, James Bean and myself in a book called Democratic Schools. It goes on in the critical discussions that are going on about what is happening with participatory budgeting in Brazil or in the people's science movement in India and in Tamil Nadu and the nations and nations could be throughout the world. It's true for CREA, the Interdisciplinary Research Center at the University of Barcelona. It's a model in many ways, as well as colleagues doing similar work in Valencia and elsewhere. It's a model for the kind of work we need to go on. And in English-speaking nations, that's a complicated word I want to deconstruct immediately to know that I just made a mistake. In some nations where English is seen as the dominant language, um, did I get myself out of that one? I'm not sure. Um, anyway, we can see, for instance, at the Center for Equality Studies at University College Dublin, which too has been a center of research and action that stresses not only poverty and inequality, but movements towards equality. Thus, we must document gains, not only losses. The right is very good as in the media of circulating the hoggers. We need to be much better about circulating the victims. <coughs> Fourth, when Gramsci argued, oh, I feel so much better. Uh, when Gramsci argued that one of the tasks of a truly counter-hegemonic education and of committed cultural workers was not to throw out elite knowledge, but to reconstruct its form and content so that it served generally progressive social needs, he provided another key to the role of organic and public intellectual work. That is, we should never be engaged in the process of what might be called intellectual suicide, believing there is nothing we can teach. You are here because of the sacrifices of so many people who are alive and no longer alive. Our task is to give back what we know in a way that is connected to the genuine problems that people in real schools and communities face. Giving back. Not to be so damn guilty that somehow we learn stuff. Everyone in this audience sacrificed to be here and continues to sacrifice to be here. The way you pay back that debt is not to forget what we know, but to teach it and to learn other ways of doing it. Otherwise, it seems to me that it is very dangerous. It's a sort of false modesty. And as my father reminded me when I said, I'm so tired of being an academic dad, maybe I should go back and be a teacher. Was any of this worth it? And he looked at me and he said, what the hell did you just say? <laughs> that is the most disrespectful thing you have ever said in your life, Michael. Your mother and I sacrificed work jobs all the time so that you could be someone we would be proud of politically and intellectually. If you ever doubt our sacrifices, 
I will disown you. <laughs> My father was a very smart guy. His words echo through my talk. We must give it back and be criticized when we don't understand. All right. Number five. In the process, critical work has the task of keeping progressive work alive. In the face of organized attacks on collective memories of difference and critical social movements, we, it's absolutely crucial that these traditions that live through us be kept alive, renewed, and when necessary, criticized for what is wrong with them. This involves being cautious of reductionism and essentialism, and asks us to pay attention to what Nancy Fraser so brilliantly called the politics of redistribution and the politics of recognition. And that means that our purity should never be our goal, nor should the search for one theoretical apparatus that will explain everything. Rather, the constant rich debate, the growth of multiple critical traditions in constant conversation with each other, what I might call, and I, you know, what I call in the new book, in Can Education Change Society, the search for decentered unities, things that bind us together. I'm so tired of the postmodern structural debate I can scream. <laughs> Both are necessary. Now can we do some work? <laughs> Six, keeping such traditions alive and also supportively criticizing them means we have to ask a question. For whom are we keeping them alive? And how and what form should they be available? That means that we, we are required to learn how to speak in different registers to different audiences. So if I am speaking here, I may quote or make a joke about Foucault, and some of you may laugh. But if I'm doing community work in real schools being taught and learned, if I quote Foucault, it's coffee time. <laughs> now, I don't mean that as a joke. It does require what the right has done, to work at multiple levels in multiple registers. And that requires not sacrificing theoretical or empirical complexity. It means if I can't say it more clearly, I don't understand it well enough yet. It calls upon us to be teachers as well, so that we can not only teach but be criticized. It's discursive politics at its best. Now the right is very good at this, and we must relearn these skills. It also means we must be much better at using the media. Much, much better. Seven, I'm almost done. Um, critical educators then must also act in concert with progressive social movements that their work supports, or in movements against these rightist assumptions and policies they critically analyze. And this is another reason that scholarship that is supposed to be organic means that we must be public intellectuals as well. One must participate in and give one's expertise to movements, but it also implies learning from these social movements, taking risks and mobilizing with them, not leading them, but participating. That is, our task is not to avow the role of the unattached intelligentsia in Mannheim's terms, Living on the balcony, to quote Bakhtin, is not the appropriate model. And anyone who understands the history of the balcony would understand that it is a way of looking, it's historical, which are looking at carnival from above and saying, look at the transgression below. Am I glad I'm up here? That is not our task. To quote from a complicated but brilliant sociologist and cultural analyst, Pierre, the late Pierre Bourdieu, in his book, Firing Back, as he reminds us, our intellectual efforts are crucial, but they cannot stand aside neutral and indifferent from the struggles in which the future of the world is at stake. Eight, building on the points I made above, the critical scholar activist, the public intellectual, has another role to play. Sheer, he needs to be a deeply committed, men committed mentor, someone who demonstrates through her or his life what it means to be both the best researcher possible, but also a committed member of a society that is scarred by persistent inequalities. 
We need to show how one can blend these two worlds together in ways that will never be perfect, will always be tense, but embody the dual commitments of exceptionally committed <coughs> social research and participating in movements whose aim is to interrupt dominance. And I would hope it should be obvious that this should be fully integrated in one's teaching as well and in one's commitments to one's colleagues also. Finally, participation in all of this means using the privileges one has as a person who is a researcher, who also for many of us has positions at universities or research organizations. But as each of us needs to make use of one's privilege to open the spaces at universities and elsewhere for those who are not here, for those who do not now have a voice in that space and in the professional sites to which being in a privileged position all of us have access to. Absent presences, absent presences then are crucial. Who is not in this audience? Who is? That is not to make us feel guilty. It is to say there are people who are our teachers as well. And part of our commitment must be to expand the people who engage in the conversations where we live at the same time. This can be seen, for example, in the history of the activist in residence program at the University of Wisconsin, my home, the Haven Center for Social Justice there, where committed activists in various areas, the environment, indigenous and immigrant rights, gender, housing, labor, racial, struggles, education, and so on, are brought in with a full professor's salary for one month to give lectures, to find themselves, to teach us about how we can make the commitments that help them. So that the dialogue is there not through the distance, but so that we are there together. It can be seen even more powerfully in women's studies programs throughout the United States, where community members are on the boards of governors, or the best examples with indigenous, aboriginal, and First Nation peoples throughout the world, Roma as well, where the elders participate in the governance structures of the indigenous rights centers and academic units on campus. Let me conclude now. The words you've been waiting for. That was the first half. <laughs> that wasn't a joke. No. <laughs> Conclusion. Everything I said before was wrong. Okay. Okay. Someone took my paper. Okay. Okay. These nine tasks I've discussed are demanding. And of course this list, as I mentioned, is only a beginning. No one person can engage equally well in all of them simultaneously. I can't do it myself. These are collective tasks. What we can do is honestly continue our attempt to come to grips with the intense intellectual, personal, political, and practical tensions and activities that respond to the demands of the role of the critical scholar activist as public intellectual. And this requires, unfortunately, or in my mind, fortunately, a searching critical examination of one's own structural location, of one's overt and tacit political commitments, of one's own embodied actions once this recognition in all its complexities and contradictions are taken as seriously as they deserve. Yet if we look around the world, there are individuals, researchers, institutes, coalitions, unions, dissident groups, social movements in every country represented in this room who have played and continue to play such a large part in the continuing struggles to build an education that is truly critically democratic in nations and nations to be. Can we do any less? But let us be honest. As my introductory example on the attempts to silence me and others demonstrates, dominant groups often prefer the epistemological farm. And they will not stand idly by while we individually and collectively act to speak back. Nor can they totally control its act, its outcome. Spaces for counter-hegemonic work are constantly being created at the very same moment as dominant groups <coughs> seek to close other spaces. Recognizing and filling these spaces is as crucial an act as it has ever been, because education is part of society. 
and indeed some of the best examples of doing this can be found among the lives of people sitting graciously listening to someone talk in this room. As I demonstrate in much more detail than Can Education Change Society, which is on sale for four times the price outside. <laughs> By the way, my wife and I, the other Professor Apple who is here, um, all of the money we get for our books goes to social movements. Even though I'd like to drive a large Mercedes, that's a different issue. That was a joke. <laughs> so, in so many nations of the world, there is a very long tradition of radically interrogating educational inst institutions, of asking who benefits from their dominant forms of curriculum, teaching and evaluation, of arguing about what might be done differently, of asking searching questions of what would have to change in order for this to happen. And most importantly, in providing crucial answers to how this can and does happen. This tradition has worked through me, as well as many others, inside and outside this room. Let me conclude, though, with the last paragraph by being honest about something else. As someone who grew up very poor, I always try to remember the debts I owe to the sacrifices made by so many other people. All of us stand on the shoulders, all of us stand on the shoulders of many others who have taken such issues seriously and the shoulders of those people whose seen and unseen labor pays our salaries, and provides the spaces for our work. If we think of thick democracy as a vast river, it increasingly seems to me that our task is to keep the river flowing, to remove the blockages that impede it, and to participate in expanding the river to be more inclusive so that it flows for everyone. And let us remember what is happening so very near to us right now. The river includes the thousands and thousands of people who are arriving in Hungary and so many other countries, struggling to find a place to live, to work, to dream of a better life, to raise their children, to not be the other, but to be part of the we. The right, neoliberals, neoconservatives, and so many others may consistently try to deny that dream to alter the flow of the river. But the river cannot be stopped. It flows on and on and on and on. Perhaps it should be our river as well. Thank you. But I have failed to disseminate uh, this knowledge. 
and the problem is that there is not a political power group for these democratic political ideas, but there are also some uh, educational power groups uh, who resist them and they cooperate cordially in themselves and with uh, media groups as well. So it is very hard to disseminate these such critical ideas and perhaps the only way is to do with, uh, in cooperation with uh, our scholars in our democratic countries. Do mm. so you agree with that and are you willing to cooperate? Thank you. Uh, please, uh, can we get the micro here, down? Uh, there was somebody here, you? Yeah. You can start with Martin. Hello, my name is uh, Diana. I'm from Portugal. Uh, I love to hear your words. Thank you for that. Uh, although your words make me feel uh, bad or uh, not quiet, uh, I don't know what to work. <laughs> and the thing is, I am an academic. Now uh, I have uh, a position, in a management position in my institution. And all that you said make a lot of sense to me. But when I look uh, in my daily life, uh, I want you uh, to help me to show how can I, as an individual, make a difference in my institution. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the third question is over here. Hello, Michael. Victoria Casselli from Kingston University. Um, I love your taxonomy, and given that you've obviously been working on this and evolving it over time, if you had to add one more item to this list, what might it be, knowing what you now know? Thank you very much. And the last one, I guess, somewhere. Can you raise your hand again? Oh, yes. Oh, it's here. Yep. Very simple. Very wait, wait a little bit. Wait a little bit. My is coming. How can our conference show, how can our conference show its solidarity with refugees? Speak out. Uh, I think it goes beyond putting money in the bucket. Thank you very much. And um, <coughs> that's all for today. Let's <laughs> step back. I wish you would ask questions about the weather. There are a lot of <laughs> First of all, I cannot answer questions such as what should somebody else do. Let me give an example of why I say that. Um, there are many, many people who have to feed their families in a time when there are no careers, there are temporary jobs. So it's easy for me to say what I would do, but not so easy at times. But I think that one of the, one of the forms that the left has shown is a kind of arrogance, blaming people without listening to their conditions. Because of that, I feel sometimes paralyzed by questions that ask, what should I do? It's one of the reasons I want to say we must be critical secretaries. There are people in management positions all over the world. And as Kathleen Lynch shows in a book called Affective Equality, and in her most recent book on the new managerialism in education, you are not alone. There are many women, in particular academics, academics who become research officers or deans or financial people at universities, and the material circumstances of their lives are trying to get enough money so their colleagues can do their work. Which means they have to play the managerial game and be pretty damn good at it. And yet they suffer through constantly saying, my job is 24-7. I do not have time to be with my family. I do not have time to do the political work that I do. 
what should I do? Yet there are just as many people forming alliances with other folks in exactly those positions <coughs> to say, this is what I do to survive. So my answer, you know, forgive this, I, mean, I don't mean this to be cute, is a collective one. There are people in these situations taking risks also. But my job is not to tell without having a serious conversation with you over multiple cups of coffee, right? to say, well, I don't even know you in your situation. I spent enough time in a very simple country called Portugal to be able to answer what you should do. That, that response worries the hell out of Okay, so I just have to be honest about that. I think, I think it's a magic trick. Okay, so I think it is collectively answered. And the same thing uh, for, for uh, uh, my, uh, our colleague from Estonia. I think that the material conditions, uh, I'll, I'll give an example from a place that uh, I know well. My wife and I are professors at a number of universities in China. China is the most complicated nation I have ever been in in my life. And every time I am in Beijing or Shanghai, or now in Chengchun in the north, I become more stupid the minute I get off the plane. And the reason is because it is such a complicated place. And that means that what I thought I understood before is now more complicated. So two years ago, I was able to talk about race and to work with the University of Nationalities in Beijing. And it was OK to talk about race and to talk tactically about what could different ethnic traditions and groups do about changing the curriculum. But given what is happening in the West, in China now, the government has said, you must be more careful when you're talking about that, because it is too complicated. And Michael, you don't understand. And in many ways, I don't. I thought I did, but now the political and cultural situation is hard. So my first step in answering this, whether it's for Estonia or China or Hungary, is to say, first, teach me. Because otherwise, it is too abstract. And the answers to the questions are never abstract. They're about real people's lives. Which is not to say I'm stupid about this. You know, when I joke about my arrests, it's both a mark of pride and a mark of fear. But I cannot tell other people what to do. But I can talk, if I've got one more minute, about the refugee situation. First, we have to purge our vocabulary about words like immigrants, refugees. Diasporic populations are there because of empire. Europe created these situations. And the first thing, I mentioned this yesterday, the first thing we have to ask is what are our debts? So I'll give one example of that. I'll use the same trope I did last time. If this was the United States, I would say, how many of you in this room took a course in algebra? And I'd ask for a show of hands. Now that's a mathematical thing that we normally do in the States in the last year of middle school, first year of secondary school. And everyone raises their hand. Yes, I had a year of algebra. And I'll say, no, you didn't. No one in this room ever had a course called algebra. You had a course called algebra, which was from Iran, Iraq. The principles of our science, mathematics, architecture, medicine, astronomy, are from these places. Europe owes its civilization not only to the Greeks and Romans, but to the places now who are demanding rights after we created an empire that formed borders so that people were religiously fighting each other so that we could benefit. In the same way the United States claims that it is a Christian nation, when the most recent brilliant historical research has unearthed the fact that enslaved people stolen from Africa, 20 to 30 percent of the people were very literate in Arabic and were Muslim. And they built the economy. So the United States is formed first out of genocide to indigenous people, 
and then clearing the land and building our industry it is formed out of the enslavement of Muslim groups. So rather than saying what we should do, the first step for me is to say, wait a minute, what are my debts that I can never repay but must try? And that requires that I have to look at people as someone I owe something to, not as the burden. Okay? Then I think that money is important. People need food and water. But all of us participate in this. My nation is about to take perhaps 1,500 people from Syria and Libya. My responsibility is not the train station, though that's important. My responsibility is the United States. What can I mobilize about that? Since my nation is acting in an incredibly racist imperial way. So my answer is go back and make certain that you're doing something not only here, but there as well. And that's as honest as I can. But thanks for the questions.